Welcome to, uh, day, to day two of BroCon. I'm, I'm doing the morning uh, introduction duties. Um, I don't think, I'm going to let uh, these next few guys from Ceiling Tech introduce themselves and, uh, and talk about what they're working on, but um, I, I'm pretty excited to see this, talking about how they've approached uh, using Bro in Kubernetes and DevOps stuff, and I don't want to talk about it much, because I'll let them do it. Anyway, here are the uh, Ceiling Tech guys. Good morning. Is this thing on? It is. Um, so, uh, this is the hangover talk um, for everybody that uh, hit it hard last night, and, and uh, so we'll, we'll try to talk softly uh, for everybody. Um, uh, do we have the, uh, do you have like alerts and everything off so we don't get random messages like Slack? Like, <laughs> you can already see it, like, hey, thanks for your contribution to Suricata this morning. You know, you're like, whoa. Uh, um, so uh, my name's Ed, this is Dan. Uh, we're actually local here in the D.C. area, uh, Columbia, Maryland. Um, uh, work a lot on kind of perimeter defense, architecture engineering. Uh, fair warning, this isn't a security talk. Um, this is more of a, a little bit more of an engineering and architecture uh, talk. So <clears throat> every year we do a, um, a project, and kind of a, an internal project, and try and solve some big problem. And... Uh, uh, this is one of the things that kind of sparked this off. So, so uh, is the person that, uh, the folks that wrote the um, 2015 Berkeley Labs 100G Bro Cluster, are they in here at all? Show of hands, boom. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. This, is, um, this was one of my favorite documents that I've read yet in terms of Bro. So th this was fantastic. Um, uh, because we've got uh, customers right now that are looking at rolling out 100 gig networks, or they already have rolled out 100 gig, net gig networks, and they're struggling to find um, uh, a way to architect uh, something that is scalable. So uh, scalable, multi-tenant, uh, those kind of things. So when I first read this, I thought, man, that is a fantastic architecture. It's like 56 nodes put together, uh, multiple layers of, uh, of tap ag, you know, kind of distributing everything out with bros. It was really cool concept. My first thought was, um, how long did it take to build this? Uh, it, it probably took a little while to build this thing. And, and at the end of the day, it's a, it's a massive bro cluster, but that's one piece of your overall security architecture, right? Because you've got to send the data somewhere, you've got to analyze it somewhere. Um, so, so we kind of took this uh, look uh, at this and said, okay, is there any way as an engineering team that we can try to um, automate this, improve this, and bring this kind of technology out to the rest of the world? Um, by the way, on the, uh, on the slides, you're going to see uh, a little pony at the bottom of every slide. That's, that's our indicator to know whether it's me that's talking or Dan that's talking. So um, <laughs> if it's the pink pony, it's Dan. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this can't be that hard, right? Um, there's technologies out there. Uh, we want to build it once and deploy it anywhere, right? That's a common cloud-based theme. Uh, we want to have uh, multi-tenancy with resource segregation. Um, that means effectively having you know, one cluster of servers that has, you know, multiple bros and, um, and sims and, and pieces for one tenant on the exact same hardware having, uh, you know, uh, multiple instances of another whole another architecture in it and, and uh, shared, shared hardware with resource segregation, um, shared rules across a massive cluster um, so that you're not trying to update your scripts on, you know, 150 instances of bro. Uh, and shared resources across different tools. So that, this can't be that hard, right? So we started looking at what an architecture for this might look like. Um, of course, bare metal that, that uh, scales, horizontal, uh, scales horizontally. Um, then we wanted to layer on some kind of virtualization technology. Um, Docker, KVM, something like that. Um, then we said, okay, we, we need an orchestration layer. Um, Kubernetes is like this magical thing. If, if uh, Okay, this is a security uh, community. So, <laughs> so last year at BroCon, uh, I've, I've got a story real quick, a sideline. Last year at BroCon, um, uh, there was a, a few people that, I, that actually are in here right now that we all went out and, and um, grabbed lunch one day, and they were all complaining about their job as security and how this Docker stuff and this Kubernetes stuff is driving them crazy because their application developers are just randomly throwing code on the wire and they, and um, uh, whenever they want, and it's all buggy and all this stuff. So. 
Uh, so now we're doing that as a security community. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but honestly, when we dig into it, there's a reason that, that it's had this mass adoption and that Docker and containers and Kubernetes are, are um, uh, hitting it really big. Um, and there are security layers being put into it. Red Hat's in, in, uh, investing a ton of money in SE Linux and um, uh, Intel and some other companies are getting behind uh, hardware segregation of uh, security measures. So anyway, that's, that's my side note. Um, then we need some kind of networking layer, right? This was actually one of the harder parts that, that, uh, that, that we're going to talk about. Um, but, uh, and then last, we, we wanted to put some kind of, uh, effectively, an app layer. Now, what we're going to be talking about here is, is Bro specifically, um, some of the challenges. We're going to walk through <clears throat> how we, w what our path to enlightenment has been uh, for trying to get Bro inside of a, uh, a container, inside of a cluster, uh, a cluster manager, and then being able to segregate and route traffic through this you know, big cluster of servers. Um, so it started in about December 2016, um, after I read uh, that, that beautiful document that I uh, had up there earlier, and just said, OK, can we containerize this thing and still get decent performance? Um, in the summertime, we, uh, we had a, a few interns in the company, and, and you know, we, we said, hey, can you guys look at this, dig in a little bit of deeper, figure out if you can automate the deployment of the infrastructure. And then the summer of uh, this year, um, we took one more path, one more phase to it, and said, OK, can we, can we make this thing actually scalable? Like, if we add, uh, if we've got a 10-node cluster, and say that 10-node cluster can do you know, uh, 12 gigs per second of throughput, can we just drop on 10 more nodes and double throughput and have it um, uh, kind of a seamless scalability here? Um, so a big question that, that uh, we had to tackle right off the bat was um, containers or VMs, right? Um, VMs have a, a lot of benefits to them. They've been around for a long time. Um, actually, uh, folks like uh, Mike Shirk in the BSD world would probably tell you that containers have been around in a long time as jails. Uh, that's a whole other animal that we'll talk about. Uh, but uh, virtual machines have resource segregation. They've got a uh, whole guest OS. They're very popular. You can download like 10 different hypervisors to use. Um, but they've got their limitations with what we, we use. How many people here have ever tried to run um, a high-speed NSM inside of a uh, virtual machine? Yeah, it's, it's painful, isn't it? It can be painful. Um, your performance tanks like crazy. Uh, in packet processing, the kernel is your enemy, right? Um, that's why there's so many technologies out there to try to bypass the kernel, like PFSense and NetMap and SRIOV and DPDK, right? Everybody's just trying to get around the kernel. When you use a virtual machine, you're, you're literally putting a second kernel in it. Now you've got to go through one kernel, got to go through a second kernel. Every time each packet that goes through um, takes another, you know, 150 microseconds to process, and now suddenly you've slowed it down. Um, so moving it over to containers, um, uh, initially when we looked at it, we said, okay, you know what? It shares one kernel, which there's some security downsides, but they're getting solved. Um, but, but now we can uh, potentially send data directly into um, the application and still use these cool bypass technologies, still get our resource segregation. Um, uh, we can also have separate networks, and you get a lot of the same benefits. So, so we kind of chose containers and Docker as a way to go through this and, and um, kind of backed off from the virtual machines. Oh, pink pony. So, so we also started, um, we, we mentioned, obviously, DevOps. And the idea of DevOps is to be able to iterate rapidly. Um, as, you're, as you're progressing, as you're building out. And uh, this was also a pretty primary goal. Uh, a lot of web companies, for example, have moved to a DevOps-oriented approach. And uh, we put up here, there's argument as to all the principles of DevOps, depending on who you ask. But these are the ones that we, we put up. Um, some ideas, we wanted self-service configuration. So that meant that um, someone should be able to go in and configure it however they needed to and, and, and deploy it relatively painlessly without having to call a bunch of admins, network admins, storage admins uh, to get it all working. Um, automated provisioning, uh, they shouldn't have to do anything once they say go and, go and do. They shouldn't have to provision network VLANs or uh, provision storage or anything along those. 
Um, continual build is the concept that we should be able to um, rapidly change our code, whatever that code is, either infrastructure or how we build uh, Bro in this case, and uh, just hit a go button and it, it builds everything for us and, and deploys it. We'll show how we, we've gotten that working. Um, continuous integration, the idea behind this is when we deploy Bro, um, we want it to automatically be working with its entire surrounding architecture. So that includes things like Elasticsearch and any other, any other functions or you know, software, they should all just work as soon as they're deployed. There shouldn't be any post configuration that needs to be done. Uh, continual delivery is a concept where um, you have developers working on something and they're going to send updates on a regular basis. Instead of every maybe three months, six months, or whatever, you're going to see a lot more updating. And there's, there's some, some safety around that concept of um, because we're moving faster, we need to be able to roll back and, and so forth. Uh, automated release management is we build in versioning to our entire system. So uh, we can roll back to versions, we can add new versions, it all, all gets built in. Uh, incremental testing and, and also automated testing as well. So testing gets built in in an automated process uh, throughout this. And so this was, this was our dream. Um, this, is, this is really what we were attempting to accomplish. And we'll, we'll talk about what we accomplished at each of the phases that, that he had mentioned. Yeah. And uh, this, uh, just, you know, th this is not a product brief. We don't sell a product at all. This is pure research that we've been doing for the, uh, uh, for the sake of the community here. So, <coughs> um, so phase one, what we, what we want to do is, is try to containerize a couple of different sensors. We actually chose um, Bro and Suricata uh, both. Um, we put the, uh, the code up there. Uh, we've got a slide at the end that has some, some code. We actually um, uh, did an initial test on the performance. Um, and, and what we really wanted to look at on, on the performance side was if we ran multiple of these containers on a single uh, host and scaled it up what does that look like? So if, if uh, we had um, uh, five gigabits per second, we had this you know, little uh, box. Um, uh, it's a super micro. Uh, now thinking about it, maybe this is <laughs> <be> great. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, we were, uh, we were pumping about five gigs per second in it. Um, each, each of those one gigs was on a separate VLAN, and we divided those VLANs up um, in the hardware layer and sent it into each container. So now. We had uh, five bros running, each one in a different container, um, and one gig was going to each, uh, each bro. On a small box about this big, it cost us about 2,500 bucks to, to build. Um, and it worked, we actually uh, talked about that. There's some uh, slides from uh, bro for pros uh, early last year. Uh, but that was our first uh, instance to say, hey, th this might actually work. We can run uh, five gigs per second um, on a single box divided up am among multiple containers, uh, then, then we, can, uh, uh, we might be able to pull this off. Um, so the other beauty of it was we, we built the container once, and then we could deploy it, undeploy it, deploy it, undeploy it, um, as if as, you know, just the binaries themselves um, with all the configuration details. So the next problem was really networking. So now we've got a container that works. Um, we went through a bunch of different iterations of, of networking. Um, networking in Kubernetes or in Docker um, is, is really strange, right? <laughs> they, they just fire up bridges all over the, the darn box and, and uh, start sending data all over the place. You have to turn on, turn on IP forwarding and weird stuff. So we were trying to figure that out. It took us uh, probably a couple of months of going through different options. Um, the first uh, logical one was, hey, just turn on host networking. That way, you know, if you log into the container, the bro container, it acts like you're logging into the actual host. Like it just literally passes the entire host um, networking, all the ethernets that's on that host and pass it right into the container. Um, while this is, you know, cool, it's, uh, you have some um, problems with network isolation, right? You can't really do that whole VLAN, divide it up and send it down uh, to a single bro box. Um, uh, you can't really, get a whole lot of it. It's great for running one, one container, one bro container on a box, but if you want to try and run multiple, um, you're going to have problems. It also ties that container to that box's network configuration. So now you have to tell the container itself, hey, listen on ETH2, 
well, if you move it to a different hardware platform, ETH2 might not be the right ETH anymore, right? So, so while it worked initially, it, uh, it has some downsides. Um, the next one was, uh, you know, Mac VLAN, Mac VTAP. Um, this was a massive performance overhead. It took us a while to get it to work. It, it does technically work. There's some problems with promiscuous mode in, uh, in Mac v, VTAP, but um, it does technically work, but, but you incur a, a massive um, performance overhead. You, you can't really bypass the kernel. Um, the technologies like DPDK and um, uh, 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 PFRing and, and NetMap don't really work well with Mac VLAN and Mac VTAP. They, those are native kernel um, uh, options there. Uh, next was Open vSwitch. Um, Open vSwitch was, was really cool to test with um, because we can now put in rules to say, um, if you see uh, if all HTTP traffic that comes in on this port, send it to this container. Um, all SSL, send it to this container. So we looked at that for a pretty interesting reason. That, that being, you can now run multiple containers with Bro, each one's with different configurations, and then send certain traffic to, to one or another. Um, which had some interesting, you got to strip out some of the modules. Um, that was the, the, uh, the idea. Um, another interesting benefit from this is you can update the rules on the fly. You can drop packets in open vSwitch and those kind of things. Um, the downside, again, at the time was performance overhead. It was very complicated to try to set up. Um, we still play with this uh, concept of um, open vSwitch and, and uh, VPP, um, but uh, the last one is what we've really been putting the effort into, um, which is SRIOV. Um, the beauty of SRIOV is that uh, we can now take, uh, it, it effectively handles a lot of the kernel bypass for us in terms of moving it into the container. So we can attach a, a bro container to a specific VLAN. Um, the VLAN gets handled in the network card itself, so you've got some hardware acceleration there. And a lot of the um, hardware, uh, kernel bypass mechanisms work with SRIOV. Things like NetMap and, and some of those will actually work with SRIOV. There's a separate driver that, um, that it works with. So that's really been kind of our, our best case so far that we've had in terms of networking. So if you're playing with this, um, if you're trying to go down this path, um, uh, we would say don't even, you know, right now try and skip the Mac VLAN, Mac VTAP <laughs> stuff. That's, uh, you're gonna have problems. Um, SRIOV is uh, uh, really the way to go initially. So some of the lessons learned, um, hardware still matters. We, we still needed to worry about things like CPU pinning, IRQs, NUMA nodes, and all that. None of those problems go away. We haven't magically made solve those problems. Um, containers are great when we need to deploy a single application over and over again, but it doesn't really help us manage at scale, um, which is a next goal. Um, we haven't integrated anything, so right now all we've got is Bro uh, working and recording traffic into a log file. Um, and then uh, here's our old GitHub that's all crusty if you really want to see uh, what it was. Uh, we haven't touched that one. We have the EdCop Bro one is all our newer stuff, but I put it there if you want to see, uh, see some interesting stuff. Um, I put this at this point in the slide just to, uh, we actually figured this one out more recent, but I thought it fit better in here. Um, we do something called multi-stage containers, which are really, really slick, and they actually work well in the bro packaging process. Um, the idea behind it, if, if you've ever built a Docker container, you know it's just like a, a long list of, of scripts, right? Um, they have this thing called multi-stage container, which is a, a somewhat new feature, where essentially it's made for when you build something. We build bro from source. Um, the idea is when you build from source, you usually have to pull in a bunch of libraries that you don't want to necessarily keep around, like GCC, make, all that stuff. So um, what a multi-stage container lets us do is we build in one container in our script, and then we build a second container that then copies the output over. Um, it's really slick because now we can mess up the first container, make it you know, a gig and a half, two gigs or whatever, but our final container just has bro and the, the libraries it needs. It doesn't have any of the build tools. Um, we originally wanted to make bro packages like a, a, a runtime option for users where you would deploy, it would pull down a bro package and install. We found out that was a bad idea because a lot of the bro packages are actually building on the fly. So in order for us to do that, we would have had to have a mess of libraries in our final image, which we didn't want. Um, so 
because you want to deploy these quick, you don't want a three gig image or whatever it would have taken. Um, so our final image for Bro is 800 megs, which is actually relatively large. We're using CentOS as the base, um, but uh, that is, that, that's what we use for multi-stage containers for. Uh, so here's our progress. Not very good. Blue is what we've finished. We, we got a continual build process. We haven't achieved any of our other goals. Um, but, you know, it's progress, right? So um, the next step was phase two. Uh, we hired interns to do phase two. Uh, this, was, this was last summer, and uh, they chose Rancher, which if you're familiar with Rancher, if you want to get started, it is a very good way to get started messing around with containers um, and Kubernetes and a bunch of other stuff. It is easy. Um, there was some interesting things. So they, they had it so that automatic infrastructure set up. Uh, it was pretty easy to use, which was good. Uh, it actually, what it does is it deploys Rancher across all your hosts, and then you can deploy other technologies on top of it. Uh, I'm going to caveat this with Rancher 2.0 came out, which we haven't touched, and it's completely redesigned. So everything we did was with Rancher 1.0. Um, there was a number of things we didn't like. The one was limited customization. They try to hide a lot of the, the magic under the hood. And uh, that caused some problems, especially in the way of getting, it, like, getting the network traffic and so forth. Uh, so we were only able to get host networking working with that, which was not what we wanted to do. Um, also, we relied on Rancher, which is like a quasi, it's open source, but if you grow to a certain size, you have to pay for a license. Um, this was their, their proof of concept. It was, it was getting closer. Uh, we, we had a bunch of worker nodes. Um, you would deploy everything out. You can kind of see it's a little small, but Bro, Suricata, all the Elasticsearch gets deployed across all the hosts. Um, it worked pretty well, um, but we ended up making it better uh, with some time. But we did learn a lot of lessons along the way. Um, like I mentioned, uh, Bro was designed to be flexible, not customizable. Um, Rancher. Bro, Rancher at the time, at least, used its own overlay network, and uh, their <coughs> Kubernetes in general uses an overlay network, but there's a lot more features in, in straight Kubernetes, depending on which one you pick. There's a whole bunch. Uh, we use Calico uh, on our back end, uh, but there's, there's a ton of options for that. Um, we are basically deploying Rancher on top of Kubernetes. We thought that it added sort of an extra layer of uh, just complication. Uh, and again, Rancher 2.0, I've never looked at it, so all my, my gripes with it might have been better. It's supposed to be more uh, native to Kubernetes. <clears throat> so we're getting farther along in the, the DevOps process. We've got automated provisioning, uh, continuous building, continuous integration. Stuff was working out of the box. Uh, we hadn't really solved like the continuous delivery process of getting things up to a repository. It was still a mostly manual process. Uh, we had no release management. We didn't have any incremental testing. And I, we, I didn't put self-service. It wasn't 100% there yet. So phase three, or where we're at today. Um, so we ended up settling on Kubernetes straight. So they use for deployment, it's called kubeadm. Um, we've containerized Bro in a bunch of sensors. We have Suricata Moloch. Uh, we can deploy things inline and passive as well. Um, we wanted to be able to scale out. So the way it works today is you build a single box that becomes your master, and then you pixie boot all the rest of the boxes. So you wire them up, you slap them into a rack, and you wait 30 minutes for it to get past post, and it's pretty much up and running. Um, and then from there, all your applications get deployed across. Um, traffic needs to be load balanced, and we'll talk about how we're doing that. Um, we, we, we require a layer two load balancer. Um, we've been using a Gigamon. We've also messed a bit with Arista for the passive stuff. We like the Gigamon because it can do inline and passive really, really nicely uh, for load balancing. Uh, services are, need to be customizable by end users, so we provide a limited set of options for Bro and, and all the other tools that a user can kind of tweak in the settings um, and then still work, work out of the box. And uh, finally, we're using DevOps best practices. So uh, we're going to show kind of what it looks like, and Ed's going to talk to it. I think I okay, hit that. So, all right, so what you're seeing on the right here is really it's a, um, a graphical interface for uh, 
showing you the, no the, the nodes themselves. Um, on the left here, the, uh, we ended up using this uh, open source project called um, Kube Apps, uh, which, which is pretty interesting. It's, it's a web front end where you can basically uh, manage Helm uh, uh, deployments. So Helm is, uh, we didn't go into that very much, but um, Helm is basically a wrapper where we can wrap a container around a bunch of variables. So um, whereas a, a container you can just deploy and it's got all your binaries and everything in it, um, Helm allows you to basically now customize it and say, uh, I'll give you an example on um, if it's an IDS or IPS sensor, you can say, uh, make it inline or make it passive, right? Um, so we've got, uh, you know, again, we wanted to try to put a whole suite of tools up. Bro was a, uh, one of our key components to this um, because of the, the uh, awesome metadata that it generates. Um, so uh, go ahead and hit the uh, video back. So again, on the right here, it's just, you know, this is um, uh, out of the box, something called Cockpit. It's another open source project. So we put a bunch of documentation. This one's for Bro, as you can see. There's different configurations that you add in. Um, uh, like what packages you want and, and uh, those kind of things. Uh, then you can select what version. This was actually kind of interesting. The, uh, the version selection is uh, if you, the, the concept is if, if you're running Bro 2.5 and you want to use 2.6 or 2.61 um, or you really want to be on the cutting edge and mess around with 2.7 or 2.8, um, you can basically select that as part of the menu and it'll just pull that correct container down. Um, uh, and then you uh, type in, you know, you change your variables and hit deploy. When you hit deploy, you'll see on the right there, it popped up a container. So again, those black, these black ones are your nodes. Um, you can see it's popping up the containers. Uh, you can access those containers directly from the shell, just like you're logging into a, a box. Um, so this shows just a deployment of, um, of Bro on, on top of a three node cluster. We, we ended up using something called um, in Kubernetes uh, daemon sets, um, which, which all it does is you tell, tell the sensor um, anything that's labeled sensor, deploy it there, right? So you can have a hundred node cluster, let's say 20 of them you've labeled as sensors, um, it will deploy Bro on those 20 only. And you can label some other ones as uh, uh, storage or event management or whatever, and it'll deploy the containers uh, there. So um, that, that was kind of an interesting, we, we really liked that idea. Uh, and, and talking to something like the, um, the 100 gig uh, paper, um, it, it had 56 nodes in that uh, Bro cluster. If, if you had 100 nodes and you need to do Elasticsearch and Bro and, and um, uh, Moloch and these other tools, you would take those 56, install CentOS, um, uh, connect it into the, uh, the cluster and just label it as uh, sensor, label it as bro, and it'll just deploy it out across all 56 at the same time. Um, so, okay, uh, another big problem that was run into when, when moving to Kubernetes, this is, this is actually the first, if, if you try and use um, any sensor in Kubernetes, the very first problem you're going to run into is uh, the, the people that... Uh, uh, up at uh, Google and Docker that invented this stuff, only thought that a container should have one interface, right? Um, that doesn't really work for people in this community, right? You really have to have an interface that's gonna be listening and collecting the data, and a separate interface that's gonna be sending your logs out, maybe even a third one for out-of-band management. Um, so Intel, uh, uh, Intel, the company, identified this and, and created this uh, project called Multis, which allows you to have multi-NIC containers. Um, this, was, this is really one of the things that kind of enables this entire thing to work. Um, and we've got a lot of uh, stuff on the GitHub. If you want to try and go down this path, there's a lot of stuff on the GitHub of how to get this to work. Um, and it's actually being integrated natively into Kubernetes now uh, in the latest versions. Um, you still have to be able to turn it on. Um, just real quick, because we're running out of time. This is our tra traffic acquisition. Uh, if you can imagine, it comes into a Gigamon. Um, it then gets sent across multiple hosts inline, and then it actually gets sent passive. And, and if we had multiple tools that are passive, that's fine, um, because the, the NICs are, are virtualized, um, and they're able, to, they're able to all listen off of that, that NIC. Uh, this is just a picture of our auto-build process. So when we, 
we, we do everything in Jenkins, so we, uh, we submit our code in the GitHub. Um, and the code is both the infrastructure code, which is how it should look inside Kubernetes, and then the Docker container. Jenkins runs out, it builds the container, it pushes it to a repository. Um, we can then push it to a test cluster. Uh, we also run some, some level of testing, like make sure it's grabbing traffic and a bunch of other stuff. We, we have it kick off a, uh, a traffic generator, make sure it sees traffic, and then it gives us a report. So like, it's pretty neat, because you can, you can hit go, you then come back after 20 minutes and you get this nasty red diagram where it tells you where it fails and you have to go back and figure it out. But it's still a lot better than having to manually test it every time. Uh, and that's a, a pretty core fundamental concept of Bro. Uh, this crazy diagram, we have multiple deployment options. Uh, the first is basically standalone mode where everything gets put into every cluster. Uh, or on every host, you're going to have Elasticsearch and Bro in the same boxes. Cluster mode would be, it's all one big cluster, but like you're dedicating some boxes to Elasticsearch, some boxes to Bro, uh, some boxes to other things. And as he sort of mentioned, you just label the boxes as to what you want them to do. And then the last is external mode. If let's say you just wanted to run sensors, we can do that as well. And then you would just say, here's my, my Redis instance, and it would push all the, the stuff to it. Um, a interesting thing, we said we still do CPU pinning. This is kind of how we do it, and we actually talk about why it works pretty well. If anyone's done anything with network acquisition, you understand there's something called NUMA nodes. And if you're passing data from a network card into Bro or Suricata or whatever it is, a sensor, um, it works better on whatever the network card itself is tied to. If you want to send it to the other processor on a two-processor two system, you, you take a performance overhead hit. So what we do is when we get a box, we plug the network card in, figure out what NUMA node it is on, and we just dedicate that NUMA node to just the sensors. So um, we tell kernel, hey, don't, don't schedule anything to this, and that's where Elasticsearch and all that stuff is going to go. Um, actually, the Berkeley, uh, no, it was, it was another one, but some people get around this by actually installing two network cards, um, which works. Uh, there's some other ways to get around it, but that, that's, that's how we do that, so we don't have to worry about the Numino because our network is only tied to what, what's going to our sensors. So here's where I show off my PowerPoint skills. Um, here's our, 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 our uh, final, final, uh, final thing. We, we've got a self-service configuration. Users can now go in and modify as they need. Automated provisioning, we've got that. Um, we have a continual build process now through Jenkins. Uh, continuous integration, everything is working out of the box. Uh, continual delivery, we push everything up to repos and then once we push it up, it be just becomes another option users can select and, and deploy. Um, automated release management, Jenkins also does that. And then incremental testing, we're using Jenkins as well. Um, last bit is some random so iterations of our clusters. So we're not in any hurry. The, um uh, we still got 10 minutes. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, the, um, uh, so yeah, we, we went through, uh, again, we had three phases. We did three different tests. Um, uh, the first one on the left was um, when, when Dan and I racked it up, and we're, we're horrible at this stuff. Um, the second one was uh, where the interns racked it up. We used different hardware. Um, but uh, it was basically this uh, six-node cluster with a Gigamon. Each node was running uh, Intel XL710 cards. Um, the Gigamon was uh, sending 10 gigs of interfaces, but we weren't actually sending 10 gigs of traffic. Uh, and then the third one was this interesting, um, again, the whole point of what we were trying to do is to make it scalable, right? So we wanted to be able to scale down to something that's a little tactical, um, that, that's a tactical you know, four or five node cluster that can be pulled out and, and done for um, incident response missions, or something that's kind of a rack mount that's, that's there stable to do, you know, 20, 30 gigs. So we kind of tried a, a couple of different configurations with, you know, a small tactical box and, um, you know, uh, push button deployment of the, you know, kickstart the cluster, install bro, and have it up and running very, very quickly uh, versus something wh that is um, uh, long term, just, just passing uh, traffic. So. 
So lessons learned here. Um, one of the things that we learned really quickly is Kubernetes, the whole community, is just constantly iterating. It's kind of insane. There's always a better new product coming out. Um, and then, of course, there's always risk in sort of tying any solution to a product, and then, then something else comes out better, and now you have to move. Uh, it, is, it is crazy. The whole community is, is just developing insanely fast. Uh, and we've changed stuff all the time just, just to, to when to new up. things come out. Yeah. Um, it, designing an infrastructure, is, uh, Kubernetes in general, is a, a change of thinking. You have to start thinking of everything as being disposable. Um, one of the DevOps terms is cattle versus pets. So the idea is that cattle you keep, you, you, or no, I'm sorry, pets you keep, you, 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 you want them, you know, you're nice to them, you feed them a lot, whereas cattle you basically use them and then you shoot them and you're done. Um, and that's what you have to think about, right? So um, everything we do, we think uh, this is just going to constantly be getting blown away. We don't upgrade anymore. What we do is we replace on the fly. So when we deploy a new version of Bro, Kubernetes will deploy the new version and then destroy the old version and get traffic going to it. Um, state, stateless apps are generally uh, much easier to handle than stateful apps. So Bro we consider stateless. What that means is we don't really care about the, the data inside of Bro. Because what we do is once Bro records it, it, it shoots it out to Elasticsearch. Once it's in Elasticsearch, I don't, I don't care if that data disappears. Um, so Bro is a great solution, or Kubernetes is a great solution for things like Bro. It's much more difficult for stateful apps. That's one area that the Kubernetes people is working on a lot. Uh, so things like Elasticsearch, it can be done. You just have to be a whole lot more careful. Obviously, you don't want to lose all your data. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's much harder to rapidly iterate uh, around this concept. <laughs> um, bro works, in, and the last line is bro works great inside Kubernetes. You just need the plan, and you need to subscribe to their way of thinking. So one other uh, thing that, um, uh, before you uh, close it down, uh, some of the areas that are still left open, right, that, that we, haven't, we haven't researched, we haven't gotten to it, the, the next steps. Um, so uh, centralized logging um, and having uh, uh, the log management, uh, event management uh, transport handled on the fly is one area that, that we're looking at next, which is kind of the central Kafka layer where, uh, that, that spans across the entire cluster, where when you put on Bro, it creates a topic and then starts uh, dumping data on that topic, and, and you can have any other uh, device that's subscribing to that topic. That's another kind of area iteration that, that we need to, um, to get to. Uh, right now, when it comes to Bro, we're, we're literally each container is its own self-contained con Bro um, instance, which means it's running the proxy, it's running the manager, it's running all that stuff within that container. Um, we realize, and especially after uh, uh, talking to uh, Justin yesterday, this isn't a great approach, right? We want to have that cluster that, that um, seamlessly maps everything together where the workers, the containers across the entire cluster, um, physical cluster, are uh, all working together. That way, uh, like um, the DHCP uh, stuff that Seth was uh, talking about yesterday, can actually work together, right? Um, DNS queries are, are, uh, are able to kind of be uh, synchronized together. So that's another instance that uh, is a, another area that we need to improve upon. Um, uh, so these are just our, our GitHub repos. Uh, we have a website uh, as well. Um, the deployment platform is the, the ISO, if you will, uh, that builds out our OS, which is based off of CentOS. Um, it stalls Kubernetes for you automatically. Uh, it does some extra stuff like Multis and all that. Um, and then all our tools are edcop-whatever. So edcop-bro, we've got a bunch of them. Um, we ended up splitting them up because of Jenkins, uh, just kind of the way it worked. It made it more sense to be in separate, separate uh, containers. And full disclaimer, th this is a research project. I mean, it's all open source. Everything's there. It's a research project, though. Don't deploy this in production. <laughs> all right. Um, I think we've got five minutes. Are there any thoughts, questions? They're out there. Uh, sir? Did you look at any uh, alternative base images like uh, Alpine? 
So um, I can go into that. I, we did. Um, it, for those that don't know, Alpine is like super, super stripped down. It's like a couple of megs without anything installed on it. Um, there's, there's benefits to sticking with the same base layer. Um, with the way Docker works is if you deploy a container that uses CentOS, um, the next one that also uses a base of CentOS doesn't actually have to pull that whole layer down. So it just deploys the layer down that's the difference. Um, there was a number of things that we couldn't get working, particularly in the area of SRV with Alpine. So we could have done a lot of stuff with Alpine, but we preferred to keep it all the same because of that fact. Yeah, that, that's definitely another research area that, that we want to look at, though, to, to get that image size down, because even 850 megs doesn't seem very thin, right? <laughs> but, but a lot of that is, is Bro itself. I think the, the, the base CentOS is only like 250 of those megs, which is still a lot bigger than, than Alpine, but it's, it's not relative. It's not a huge savings for us. And, and like I said, once you pull the first one down, the rest are... It's, it's immaterial at that point. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? Has anyone else done um, work with containerizing Bro or Kubernetes? We'd love to hear from you. We got a few, perfect. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to hear from you and swap some notes. Um, uh, this is uh, why it's a community effort. So um, Dan and I are gonna be around for the, the rest of the, the day. Actually, I will, Dan might not be, but um, uh, yeah, come talk to me. I'd love to talk about it. All right, I think that's it. <laughs>